What's up, people? Listen, we're back. Bible study is back. And we're back like we never left. So I don't know where you are right now. Maybe you're on your lunch break. Um, but we're in the building and we're ready to dive into the word of God. We're excited. It's been a while um, since we've done Bible study. But how many know that the word of God is essential? Man, it's essential to everything that we do and everything that we are. So jump in on this live today, and I'm really excited. We kicked off a brand new series um, on Sunday entitled Holy Hydration. We're talking about the living water of God and how th when we um, digest and drink of the living water, then we'll never thirst again. And we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit for the next six weeks. And I'm really excited about it um, because the Holy Spirit is so important to everything that we do as believers. So we're ready to jump into the word of God. Before we jump into it, let's pray real quick. Lord, thank you for our time together today and for all that you're about to unlock to us and all that you're about to impart to us. I pray, Lord, that your word would be nourishment to our soul today, that as we lean into you, listen to your voice, that you'll give us exactly what we need. We thank you for your word, for the word of the Lord is a lamp unto our feet. It is a light unto our pathway. And we are nourished by your word. We grow through your word. Help us today to understand what you would have us to know. And we pray you'll bless our Bible study in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, share this, y'all. Um, if you're on the live, share this. Put it on your social media. Let somebody know that we are talking about the Holy Spirit. All right? So the title for our Bible study today is Water That Hits Different. Okay? Water That Hits Different. This water that we're going to be talking about, the Holy Spirit, is water that's just different. And we're going to um, dissect a few things, unpack a few things, and I think it's going to be powerful. So on Sundays, we're going to be talking about the book of Exodus or going through the book of ex Exodus and um, really unpacking instances of water in that book and the significance of water in that book. But for our time, our Bible study time, we're going to be going through the book of Acts, just highlighting a few areas of Acts and how the water of God, the Holy Spirit of the Lord really will um, impact our lives. OK, so if we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, there's no better book than the book of Acts. And let me just start by saying this, that God just doesn't want to be around you. God wants to be in you, okay? And there's a difference between being around God, being next to God, and God being in you. So um, in life, we can learn from things that we're around and from people that we're next to. So sometimes in life, we could be uh, next to a chef and learn the culinary arts, or we can be around a musician and learn how to play an instrument. And, and that's good. But when it comes to God, it's not just good enough to be around him, to be around church, to be around Christians. We want you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We want you to be filled with God. We want God to dwell in you. All right. Um, when, when God, when God released himself in the form of the Holy Spirit, he released himself in spirit form so that each of us could be filled up with him. All right. Um, and let me let me just say this as well, that the Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a he. All right. It is literally God in spirit form. The Bible says that God is a spirit. So you can't box God in. You can't limit him to a body. You can't incarcerate him to a space, to a location. But God is a spirit. All right. So when we refer to the Holy Spirit, 
we have to do our best to refer to the Holy Spirit as a he, all right? It's not an it, it is actually God. So let's jump into um, the book of Acts, and we'll start in Acts chapter 1, verse 1. I hope you have something to write with today, or you have an electronic device, because after all, it is Bible study, okay? So we're going to dive deeper into the Word of God. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. In the first book, O Theophilus, Theophilus, that's, that's a name right there. Let's just say Theo. In the first book, O Theo, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. So first of all, let's pause because Luke is writing. Luke is the author of the book of Acts, and he's saying in the first book, Theophilus. He's writing to a man named Theophilus. Theophilus was a Gentile. He was a rich man. And Luke, who had traveled with Paul um, through many of his missionary journeys, he is writing to a man named Theophilus and telling him about Jesus, telling him about what happened. So Luke says in the first book, wait, wait, what first book? Luke is referring to his own gospel. So we have the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in the book of Acts, he's saying to Theophilus, remember, I wrote to you in my gospel about all that Jesus did. So it's just like if you wrote an email to someone and you were like, hey, Barbara, I don't know many Barbaras today. <laughs> I don't know why. I said, Barbara, how many Barbaras do you know in our age bracket, right? So, so how about if you were writing an email and you were like, hey, Jen, right? You're like, hey, Jen, in the first email, I wrote to you about how we went on vacation. I wrote to you about what happened at the get together, the cookout last week. And if you did not have the first email, you would be wondering what the person is talking about because you would need the first email as a reference point to tag to the second email. Well, you can't read the book of Acts and not read the book of Luke because the book of Luke and the book of Acts are inextricably connected. So in our Bible, in our canon of scriptures, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. Really, John shouldn't be there because Luke and Acts, it's one author and it's a cohesive volume. So when they were translating the Bible, they threw the gospel there, the gospel of John, in between Luke and Acts. But really, I want you to see that Luke and Acts they're intertwined and connected. So then, if Luke is writing the book of Acts and going to be talking about the Holy Spirit, we need to go back to the book of Luke and notice one key thing, that Luke talks about the Holy Spirit before the book of Acts. He's one of the gospel writers, he is the gospel writer that references the Holy Spirit in the inception of his gospel. So a few things I want you to note from um, the beginning verses or beginning chapters of the book of Luke, that Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit in the first chapter of Luke. Zacharias, I call him Zach, he's filled with the Holy Spirit in the first chapter of Luke. And Mary is impregnated and, and she conceives by the Holy Spirit. So in the onset of Luke's gospel, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Matthew doesn't do that. Mark doesn't do that. John doesn't do that. Luke has this obsession with the Holy Spirit. 
In other words, Luke is trying to tell us the Holy Spirit has been a part of this thing all along. That before Jesus even comes, the Holy Spirit is working. The Holy Spirit is overshadowing um, and, and filling Elizabeth. The, the Holy Spirit is all over Zacharias. So what we need to know is that the Holy Spirit is at work. All right. And it just doesn't start in the book of Acts. So let's keep pushing. Acts chapter one, verse three. He or Jesus presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the father, which he said, you heard from me. So Jesus stayed with his disciples for 40 days before he ascended into heaven after he resurrected from the grave. And he says, now that I'm about to leave, I want you to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the father. The question is, what is the promise of the father? What is the promise of the father? Now, I don't know if you've ever had to wait for a promise, not even a promise from God, but maybe you had to wait for a promise from your boss or a promise from a friend or a promise from uh, a spouse. I don't know about you, but I, I don't like to wait for promises, <laughs> especially when I know what the promise is going to be. Like, like I know that you're about to give me something, or I know you're about to promote me, or I know you're about to give me a gift. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty impatient. How many people in the chat are the type that when you get something new, you immediately wear it, right? <laughs> when you get something dope, you immediately use it. Like you get a, you get a brand new outfit. You get a brand new pair of sneakers. You wear it. I don't get these type of folk that get new stuff and then they put it away and they never wear it or they wait a year and they never, you know, to wear it. And, you know, I'm not that type of person. If I'm going to buy it, if I'm going to receive it, I'm going to use it. I'm going to wear it. I don't know if you're like that, but uh, my dad, he's a funny character because if you go to his into his closet right now, he has shirts, he has ties, he has shoes, he has socks that he bought five, ten years ago. And they're still in the original packaging. And it's like, yo, are you ever going to wear it? You know, why would you buy it if you're not going to wear it? I, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty impatient when it comes to stuff like that. I got to wear the stuff that I have. And so these disciples they have to wait in Jerusalem for this promise, but they know what the promise is. Um, sometimes in life, sometimes in our walk with God, he has given us a promise, but we're not exactly sure what it's going to look like. We're not exactly sure um, what it's going to entail, but these disciples know what the promise is. So the question is, what is the promise of the father? Let's go to John chapter 14. Verse 16, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's telling them, hey, I'm going to be leaving soon, but I'm going to ask the father and he will give you another helper, capital H, to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him. For he dwells with you and will be in you. So Jesus is saying, there's a comforter coming. There's a helper coming. And the world cannot see him. That's the clue. It's a spirit. The world will not discern him. The world will be surprised. The world will be blinded to him. But you will know him and he will be 
in you. One of the um, one of the interesting things about the disciples is that they had a firsthand experience with Jesus. They were able to touch him. They were able to hug him. They were able to eat with him. They were able to shake his hand, right? But no matter how close they got to Jesus, he could never get in them. His teachings could get in them, but he literally couldn't get in them. And they were in a position where they didn't want Jesus to leave. But Jesus is saying, I've got something better coming. And it's God in spirit form, and he's going to be in you. So I know you'll miss me, but this helper that's coming is going to be with you in the shower. It's going to be with you in your car. It's going to be with you when you go to work. And you don't have to look for me or wonder where I am because the helper is going to be in you. And I just think we need to pause right there and give God praise for his wisdom that he did not come in flesh and expect to always live here in bodily form. But he says, no, nah, I've got to go because if I don't go, the helper can't come. And, and what's so wise about the way that God did, did this is that he knows he needs to be with each of us, no matter where we are. And the only way for him to do that is in spirit form. That's why I want you to get to the place where you can sense that God is not only with you, but in you. I feel, I feel like I'm about to go into another gear here. I, I, I want you to get to the place where you are so sure and confident that God is in you. And he's in you not because of what you know in your head. He's in you because of what you sense in your soul. Because your mind will play tricks on you. Your mind will get to a place where sometimes you're unsure and uncertain about whether or not God is really on your side. But when you can sense God in the bowels of your soul and his spirit dwells in you, it gives you such confidence to know that he'll never leave you and he'll never forsake you. And, and, and I think it's powerful for us to become aware of the fact that God is actually with us and in us, right? Um, one of the most difficult things about being a Christian is being consciously aware of God being in us and sensitive to that fact. Because if truth be told, if we always were aware of the fact that God was in us, we probably wouldn't do certain things. <laughs> yeah, we probably wouldn't go certain places. <laughs> we, if we were consciously aware of the fact that God is literally in us in spirit form, then we probably wouldn't click on certain websites. Y'all not in y'all not in this chat. We we probably wouldn't watch certain movies. <laughs> if we were consciously and acutely aware of the fact that God is literally in us that you're watching that on your phone and he's in you watching it too. That it's not a heavenly father that's somewhere in the sky in a place that we have never seen and he's far away. No, the spirit of God is in you. So when you tell that next lie, just know he's in you. <laughs> when, when you try and be shady, just know he's in you. When you type that passive aggressive comment on your social media, just know the Holy Spirit is in you. And I think if we were more enlightened to the fact that God was in us, we'd have less problems as Christians. I think we would live a whole lot better than sometimes we live. We would have to ask for forgiveness a whole lot less. 
<laughs> if we were always aware of the fact that God is literally in us. He's not just omnipresent around us. He's Emmanuel, God with us, in us. And so I think that's powerful. And I'm just laying some foundation um, for the Holy Spirit. All right? So Jesus, Luke is talking about this promise of the Father. Jesus talks about the promise of the Father. And the promise of the Father is the Holy Spirit. So let's go back to Acts. Let's go back to Acts. Acts chapter 1, verse 5. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So Jesus is talking and he's saying, John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they had, let's not even go there yet. Let's stop. I want to stop on verse 5. So here is why I love Pentecostal doctrine. I, I've been in church all of my life. I've read a lot of church history. I understand to a certain degree different theologies, different denominations, um, Reformed theology, Orthodox theology, Pentecostal theology. Why I love and ascribe to Pentecostal theology is I feel like Pentecostal theology embraces everything. So it's not perfect theology because you, can, you can't ever know God perfectly. I love it because I feel like it embraces everything. So for instance, Reformed theology doesn't, in its foundational form, it doesn't embrace the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Reformed theology says, yes, there's a Holy Spirit, and yes, the Holy Spirit's with you, but they don't embrace the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But to me, the text is clear that Jesus, this is not even Luke talking. This is Jesus talking, and Jesus is like, yo, John baptized y'all with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And if, if I'm going to take anybody's words as truth, I'm going to take Jesus's words. I can't denounce that. I can't um, step away from that or be blind to that. So there's a difference between water baptism and Holy Spirit baptism. I think that um, one of these Bible studies, I'm going to go into it in detail because in the book of Acts, there's an instance where um, the disciples come across people who were baptized according to John's baptism, which is baptism of water, baptism unto repentance. And they ask them, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believe? And the response is, we haven't heard of any such Holy Spirit. So the disciples lay hands on them and they seek and they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So to me, there is a distinction between water baptism and Holy Spirit baptism. Without even going into the day of Pentecost, which we'll talk about and what that means, even after that, we see instances of people being filled with the Holy Spirit. So then, we must say it is possible for you to be water baptized. It is possible for the Holy Spirit to be with you. But there is a distinction. There is a distinct fingerprint of the Holy Spirit that comes with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're after when it comes to water, when it comes to hydration that I just don't want to be around the water. I want to get in the water. I want to be filled with the water. I want to be baptized. Bapti baptism or the word baptized in the Greek is baptismo or baptizo, all right? And it means to be submerged. So we have um, Baptism Sunday coming up this Sunday. Put it in the chat. Baptism Sunday coming up this Sunday. We're excited about it. If you want to go public, 
with your faith in Jesus Christ, we encourage you to do that. Um, we want you to sign up for a baptism. You can do that by going to our website, go to the church app, and we will take care of it from there. Um, but there's a difference between being baptized in water and being baptized in the spirit. All right. We're going to that a little bit more, but I want to keep pushing. How y'all doing? Y'all doing good out there? And listen, put questions in the chat. That's how we do for Bible study. We'll open it up at the end for a few questions if you have any, and we'll take it from there. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They still don't get it because they want Jesus to be this militaristic king. They want Jesus to free them from the oppression of the Romans. They want Jesus to restore the kingdom of Israel. And Jesus is like, I don't want to restore the kingdom of Israel, yet what I want to do is put the kingdom in you. If I can put the kingdom in you, then we can restore the kingdom of Israel at a later date. But the way for me to put the kingdom in you is I have to put the Holy Spirit in you. Verse 7, he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Let me just say real quick, if somebody posts about when God is coming back to restore the kingdom, just delete them. Can, can you do me a favor and delete them? This is why I love Bible study, because I can say things on Bible study that I don't always get to say on a Sunday. And I, I need you to know you need a pastor. You need leaders. You need a friend. You need people in your life that can help you in these streets today. Because there's so many things and so many false notions and ideologies that you're bombarded with. You need somebody to tell you, hey, this is wrong. So when we hear people talking about God is coming back in the year 2032, God is coming back because of a solar eclipse. God is coming back. I mean, when we hear these things, we got to have the right people in our lives that can help us navigate all of the propaganda that's going on. Because Jesus is clear. You don't know. All right. I don't know. We just got to be ready. Here's what I, here's where I want to go. Acts 1 verse 8. You will receive power, power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Let's break this down. Let's unpack it. Um, I feel like the Holy Spirit and the Pentecostal experience gets a bad rap sometimes because it's an abuse of power. It's a mismanagement of power. And the reason why the Pentecostal experience sometimes gets a black eye is because we want to mishandle power and not really talk about all the other things that come with the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is power. But what is the power for? If the power is for you to show off how much God is working in your life, then you've abused the power. It's the, if the power is for you just to prophesy and everybody says, wow, this person is anointed by God, you've abused the power. If the power is for you to lay hands on people and then there's a camera so that everybody could see that when you lay hands on people, they fall out, then, then you're abusing the power. It's the, if the power is for you just to show and flex your spiritual muscles, that's not what Jesus is talking about here. He says, you will receive power 
He's not just randomly dispensing power for you to flex. He's giving you power for you to move. So we put fuel in a car, not for the car to sit in a parking lot. We put fuel in the car for the car to take us somewhere. Y'all not in the comments. And I'm tired of potential power. It's time for us to move into kinetic power. Because if the power of the Holy Spirit leaves us stagnant, if the power of the Holy Spirit renders us immobile, then we're not exercising the full strength of what Jesus is talking about. This power is not for you to sit and rest on your laurels. This power is for you to be his witnesses. So it's power and witnesses, power and witnesses. First, let's talk about power. In the Greek, the word is dunamis or dynamite. It's working power, active power, working power, active power, working power, active power. Maybe that's why this book is entitled Acts of the Apostles. It really should be entitled Acts of the Holy Spirit. But nonetheless, King James says, hey, Acts of the Apostles. I don't have a big problem with it because it is the working power of the Holy Spirit. It's the working power of God through the apostles. And why in the world are we in such a state in our generation where we say we have the power of God, but yet things aren't moving? We say we have the power of, power of God, but miracles aren't showing up like they need to. Where is the dynamite? Where is the working power? Jesus is saying, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. To be a witness means to give an account or to testify. Some Christians, I don't need you to take the stand. <laughs> There's some Christians that I see on social media and I'm looking at your life and I'm like, I'm sorry, you're a bad witness. You're a bad representative. If, if we're going to take the stand and try the Holy Spirit, you would be a bad representative. Why? Because you don't have your life isn't a living testimony of what the Holy Spirit can do. It's a living testimony of how many tongues you can speak in. <laughs> It's a living testimony of how many times you come to church. But the identification of the Holy Spirit is a testimony, a witness. It should be a case where you're making a difference in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, to the end of the earth. And God, Jesus, released the Holy Spirit to move the church forward, to move the disciples forward. And have we become so complacent that we are, um, we are comfortable to just stay in our places of comfortability, stay in our comfortable pews, and we're not moving this thing forward. So let's break down Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. Jerusalem. What was Jerusalem to the disciples? It was their family. So Jesus says, you're first going to have to witness to your family. How many folk in the chat have family that still don't know who Jesus is? Before you get on your social media and start to prophesy to the end of the earth, how about your family first? <laughs> y'all, I'm not even seeing the comments today. Um, why in the world do you have a microphone in your hand and there's folk in your family that still don't know who Jesus is? I feel, I feel God today. You know, we all want a platform 
because when we are deputized with the Holy Spirit, we feel this unction to just do so many great things for Jesus. Jesus is saying, here's the blueprint. Here are the four circles of ministry as it relates to the Holy Spirit. And you can't jump from one circle to the other until you have fulfilled the calling of God within that circle. So first, do Jerusalem. Jerusalem needs to know who Jesus is. And this is also the blueprint of the book of Acts. If you take the book of Acts and carve it into sections, you'll see that it's carved into four sections, that the apostles first work in Jerusalem, then they move to Judea and Samaria, and then Paul takes the gospel to the end of the earth. It's a blueprint. So number two, if you have the Holy Spirit, what about your friends? Y'all don't want me to start singing. I feel that song. What about your friends? <laughs> Are they going to let you down? What about your friends? Um, do they know Jesus? How many of your friends right now need to know Jesus? You have so much power, <laughs> but your co-workers don't know Jesus. You have so much power, but your best friend is a heathen. You got so much power. Samaria. Samaria is critical because Samaria is skeptics. Now, the thing about it is that when, when, when the Holy Spirit comes in you, you're filled with such, um, such power that you feel like you can conquer the world until you get hit in the mouth. So Mike Tyson says, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And a lot of immature Christians skip over Jerusalem and Judea and they go right to Samaria. And Samaria is the skeptics. And they get punched in the mouth because now you're into uncharted territory and you don't have the strength to fight those kind of demons. So you don't have the theological understanding to defend the faith, defend it against Muslims, defend it against pagan worshipers, defend it against atheists. So Samaria was the uh, place, the region where Jews were hated, right? There was tension between Samaritans and Jews. So the J Samaritans were the skeptics. And, and if you're going to be a witness in the region or the realm of skepticism, you've got to be filled up. The fourth thing is the end of the earth. And that's strangers. All right. So if you're going to take the gospel to the streets, you got to be ready. But I feel like that's the progression of the Holy Spirit. And that's where we want to lean into a, a, a church that is thriving and moving under the unction of the Holy Spirit has all four circles vibrant and moving and stretching and flowing. So a church that is functioning under the full unction of God, it connects to family. It connects to friends. It reaches skeptics. And then it pushes out to the end of the earth. So I, I pray that Link Church starts to expand its borders, that as we continue to grow, we'll impact our family, we'll make a difference with our friends. But what about the skeptics out there? What about those that really feel like um, Christianity is false? What about those that feel like, you know, um, this, this whole church thing, that, that's for the birds? Like, what about all these folks out there? And then the end of the, the earth. So it's my prayer, it's my vision as the pastor of this church that, that God would open us, that God would stretch us, that, that he'll allow us to take the gospel to the end of the earth, that we'll do our part, right, to make a difference overseas. We'll do our part to make, us di make a difference in remote parts of the world. Um, I think that's a great prayer that I want us all to lean into as we're into this sermon series, as we're diving deep, that God will flood us so that we can continue to make a difference and broaden our reach. All right. 
<clears throat> this is what I was talking about, the structure of the book of Acts. If, you want, if you're a note taker, you want to write it down. Jerusalem in the book of Acts is chapters 1 through 8. Judea and Samaria, chapters 9 through 12. The end of the earth is chapters 13 through 28. All right, y'all, almost done. I just want to highlight something else here that I saw in the first chapter of Acts chapter 1. How y'all doing? I hope this is helpful um, because we're laying some foundation as we go through the book of Acts. So let's go to Acts chapter 1, verse 13. And when they had entered, so the disciples are going to the upper room. They went into the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the zealot and Judas, the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. PJ will like that. Devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. So Luke is keen, specific enough to tell us who is in the room. We learn later in, in the same chapter, or even in chapter two, that there were 120 people in this room. But Luke is telling us a little bit about who was there. And that's important. Before I get there, they were devoting themselves to prayer. So they weren't just sitting in the room on their iPhone. Like, you know, Holy Spirit, please come while I scroll on IG. You know, Holy Spirit, please do a work in my life while I scroll on TikTok. They received the baptism of the Holy Spirit because they were devoting themselves in prayer. If you want God to move, you got to pray. Put it in the chat. If you want God to do something, you have to pray. And I don't, don't, away with all of this new theology that we can get God in 10 seconds, that, that we can sing one worship song and boom, Holy Spirit, come. Sometimes you have to put in some work. Sometimes you're going to have to grind it out. Sometimes you're going to have to be consistent. Like if you want that summer body, you're going to have to be working out from now. You're going to have to be in the gym from now so that you'll be right in the summer. And maybe it's going to take a couple times. It's going to take a week of fasting. It's going to take two months of consecration for you to have the Holy Spirit move in your life because there's so many distractions going on right now, you got to devote yourself to prayer. Man, I'm running out of time, but this is good to my soul. Who was in the room? The disciples were in the room. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, Judas, the son, uh, uh, Judas, not Judas um, Iscariot, another Judas, Simon the Zealot. All these folks were in the room. Who else was in the room? The women were in the room. That that should make a woman shout. That should have a woman in the room get happy. This is another reason why I like Pentecostal theology. Why? Because we don't leave the women out. The same anointing that falls on a man can fall on a woman. The same calling to preach and prophesy that falls on a man can fall on a woman. Because if Jesus is not leaving them out, why should I leave them out? Y'all not ready. So if the women are in the room, he just doesn't say, Luke just just doesn't say the women are in the room. He says, Mary, the mother of Jesus is in the room. Hold up a second. Luke, you just told us in your gospel that Mary conceived this child of the Holy Spirit. That means the Holy Spirit had to come on Mary for Mary to conceive Jesus, because Joseph couldn't help. So if the Holy Spirit came upon Mary, why in the world is Mary in this room? (laughs) Oh, yeah. 
Uh, why is Mary in this room if the Holy Spirit has already come on her? Because this water is different. That's why. Because this water is different. And that's what I want you to see is that it doesn't mean you're not saved. You're not going to heaven if you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit. There's other denominations that don't subscribe to this idea of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. They walk with God. They walk with the Spirit. But I want to expose you to the levels of the Holy Spirit, to water that hits different. That if Mary encountered the Holy Spirit and birthed Jesus, but yet she had to be in this upper room, what is your problem why you feel like you don't have to be in an upper room and be baptized in the Holy Spirit. That Mary obviously wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit. She was overcome by the Holy Spirit. But there were levels that she needed to be filled up with this water. Once Jesus left, she needed water that was different. That's what I want to expose you to. That's why Luke is saying, yo, these disciples were in the room. The same disciples that were overcome with the Holy Spirit to go out two by two and preach the gospel. Yes, the Holy Spirit was with them, but they need another level. The persecution they're about to encounter, they need another level. And it's my prayer that this generation would see that we need another level. So Jesus ends it. He ends it. I want to end it with this. John chapter 7, verse 37. Jesus is talking to his disciples. Well, he's not talking to his disciples. He's actually in the middle of the Feast of Tents. Right. Where all these tents are in Jerusalem, they come together um, and they commemorate the, their experience in the wilderness. The Jews are remembering how in the wilderness they had to set up tents and they, they're looking for water. So Jesus uses this opportunity to talk about water. And he says, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart, another translation says belly, will flow rivers of living water. What is he talking about? The next verse says, now this he said about the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So the water that comes out of their belly is a reference to the Holy Spirit, but it wasn't given while Jesus was around. He had to be glorified first. I just wanted to show you that there's levels to this thing, that when we talk about the water of God, we want you to be baptized, filled up with the Spirit. Listen, I could keep going, but I want to stop it right there, give you a chance for questions. Um, in the chat, if you have a question, um, if you have a question, put it in the chat and I'll try and answer it before we go um, and get up out of here. But I think this is really helpful. This is a foundational teaching as we get into the baptism of the Holy Spirit um, in terms of the day of Pentecost. I think this is really important to lay a foundation and we understand how much we need this thing. We need this thing. We need this thing. Any questions about the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Um, how, how would I know when the Holy Spirit comes to me, how would I know? Okay, so there's a question in the chat about how do I know when the Holy Spirit comes in me, all right? So the book of Acts shows us a sign that when people are filled with the Holy Spirit, there is a sign 
and the sign is speaking in a heavenly language, all right? Now, there are other signs of the Holy Spirit, for instance, fruit of the Spirit, the nine fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Um, that fruit, that fruit only comes from a life that is connected to the Holy Spirit. But the Pentecostal experience, when you're filled up, your language change. Your language changes, okay? So it is um, a situation where it's an encounter where God comes in you and then he controls your tongue. Why? Because life and death is in the power of your tongue. And so one of the initial signs of the infilling of the Holy Spirit is speaking in an unknown tongue, all right? Now, we could get into deep waters of theology, but if you're talking about what Acts shows us, the blueprint in Acts, is that when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they spoke in unknown tongues, all right? So that's how you'll know. Um, and I, I just want to draw a line of demarcation to say that the Holy Spirit can be at work at, at, in you, the Holy Spirit can be with you, and you can manifest fruit. But what we're after here is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that comes with speaking in a heavenly language. Now, PJ does a great job of this, teaching on this stuff, and the importance of a prayer language, speaking in an unknown tongues. Jesus even talked about... Um, in my name, they'll cast out devils. In my name, they'll lay hands on the sick and the sick will recover. They'll speak in unknown tongues, okay? So Jesus even talks about speaking in unknown tongues and we want you to seek for that. We want you to ask God for that and that is a sign that you're filled with the Holy Spirit. All right, any other questions? Yeah, that's what I I answered. Um, how do I know when I have the Holy Spirit? Okay, so another question that I may have missed is how do I get baptized in the Spirit? All right, so to get baptized in the Spirit is an exercise of your faith. It's not an exercise of your works. It's an exercise of your faith. So you don't need to say a specific phrase to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You don't need to run around a church. There, there's not a prescription for how to work towards being baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's an exercise of your faith. I grew up in an environment where they would promote tarrying, praying, and waiting. The problem with that is it puts frust it can put a block and a frustration because it's it, it makes it seem like you have to be a certain way you have to work to a certain um, place in order to receive it. It's really an act of your faith because it's a gift. So if you pray to God and you say, God, I want you to fill me with your spirit, you have to believe that you have received it and it will be yours. All right. So. So I, I think that's the best way I can articulate it right now. We'll do some more um, specific teaching on it, but we're about to have a flood night um, the first Wednesday of May for our prayer service. We're going to do a flood night, which is basically a worship and prayer service, and we're going to, um, we're, we want people to reach out for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It comes through your worship. It comes through your faith, all right? Um, and we just don't want people to become so fixated on it or on a tongue that they don't receive 
what God wants to give them. Um, I think sometimes Pentecostal circles can be so fixated on a tongue that people are looking for a tongue rather than just receiving the water of God, the filling of his Holy Spirit. And then it takes care of itself. All right. Yeah. All right. The question is, how can I be more effective in witnessing to family? Um, family is tough. OK, family is tough because a prophet is without honor in his own country. So family will give you the hardest time. Um, the Jews were heavily persecuted, persecuted in um, Jerusalem. OK. Jesus came unto his own, the Bible says, and his, the, his own received them not. So the Holy Spirit has to lead you for how best you can witness to your family. What I've learned is patience is so important. If you come to a particular family member who is just not with it, and all you want to do is beat them over the head with the Bible, good luck. Good luck. How about your love being a pathway to, to bringing Jesus, right? How about your grace? How about your forgiveness? We think sometimes that just pounding someone with a scripture is the only way for them to see God. Maybe they just need to see you be loving and forgive them no matter what has transpired. That's a, that's a level of forgiveness that only comes through the Holy Spirit. And then God can reveal himself to them. So I would say you really need to lean into prayer and say, God, what angle, at what angle can I come um, to hit this person and to make a difference in their life? And then the last thing I'll say on that is prayer. So you can do a lot more damage in your prayer closet than you think. If you pray without ceasing for someone, I guarantee you God will do it. If you take up the battle in your war room, in your prayer closet, and stop fighting them over the phone or through a text message, guarantee you God will move. I've seen God move after 20 years, after 30 years, because a mom just didn't ever stop praying. All right? Y'all, we've been on long today, all right? But it's been a good one. Um, I thank you that y'all are hot and heavy in this chat. And we are back like we never left. So we'll stop it there. Write down your questions. We'll try and get to them if you have any more um, next time. And we'll keep plugging along. Let me pray before we go. God, thank you for everything that you have released unto us today. Thank you for the wisdom. Thank you for your understanding that is unlocked through your word. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. Not just power, oh God, to preach. Not just power for a platform, God, but power to be witnesses. I pray you'll fill us, God. Somebody right now in this chat, they can be filled no matter where they are. They can be filled in their house. They can be filled in their car. I pray you'll do it right now, that we'll experience you in a fresh way, that the water of God would just hit different in our soul. I pray you'll bless us and keep us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, y'all, remember, Baptism Sunday is coming up. We're so excited. People have already signed up. God will be in the room, and we want to catch you right here um, in the building on Sunday. All right, y'all, have a good one. That's Bible study for today. Y'all have a good week. Take care.